So big data is on the cover of Nature, Science, The Economist, and a lo lot of other magazines. And as a researcher, whenever something hits the cover, you got to think hard and decide if the, is the topic really dead at that point because it's on the cover of a magazine, <laughs> or is there some work still to be done in that area? Um, you know, I, I've been working big data for 20 years. Um, it hasn't been popular until recently. Um, I think this is really a time to uh, switch fields. So in the, <laughs> in the last two or three years, I decided to focus on what can you do with big data in the areas of, of biology, medicine, and healthcare. So I've been working that for a few years. I want to tell you a little bit about the history of big data and a little bit about how it might impact biology, medicine, and healthcare. Uh, who, anyone recognize this? Yeah. So this is, um, so where does big data come from? More or less, if you have a lot of processors, you can do two different things with them. You can put them together and build a billion dollar instrument, such as the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, and produce lots of data. Or, as this is a little hard to see, you can um, take a few of them and spread them out into, um, you know, say 100 million devices like cell phones or cameras. Um, in both cases, you're producing lots of data. Um, traditionally, science has worked with this scale big data, but we're at a transition point, and over the last few years, we've been more working more and more with, with this style of big data. Data produced by uh, sensors, small sensors, sensors you carry around. Um, and this talk is really about both sides of that. So what's big data? This is a disk drive. Let's warm up. This is one of the um, sequencers at the Institute for Genomics and Systems Biology where I work. Uh, you take a sample, you put it in there. About a week later, um, you read out some genomic data. Uh, and these current runs are producing about 400. There's plenty of room. Are you? No, th let's be, th this is, yeah, so this is the big data. Is everyone in the right place? Okay. Uh, you know, I'm easy. What, what do people want to do? <laughs> Can I, uh, let's see here. I'll let someone else figure out because my glasses are over there. Um, it's about 400 gigabytes in size. Uh, we're doing a study and I'm going to describe a little bit about it. We're providing the bioinformatics support. We're going to collect about 600 uh, type 2 uh, genomes from type 2 diabetes patients and try to, in the jargon, stratify the de disease and understand uh, from a genomic basis, if you understand the genome well enough, can you understand, is this one disease? Is this several diseases? How do you treat it? What are the reasons, et cetera? Um, that's going to produce about 240 terabytes. That's going to fill up a rack. So if you, if you think gigabytes, terabytes, four racks is a petabyte, a thousand terabytes, that's traditionally how we've thought about thought about data, you know. And after it gets to, you know, most scientists sort of begin to get worried when they have a few racks. As you build up the number of racks, it gets harder and harder. Um, this is not really the way we talk about big data anymore. Uh, anyone recognize these? Uh, so this is an artist rendition of the Pineville Data Center in, in Oregon that Facebook uses, so, uh, Facebook. So Facebook um, used to lease in data centers two to six megawatts worth of compute. Now they build 30 megawatts of computing. So the way we talk about big data right now is you fill up a warehouse with racks or, or other types of devices, uh, other types of compu uh, computing infrastructure, and you sort of measure how much power is required to run that data center for what, you know, four or five megawatts, 30 megawatts, and that's where big data starts. Yeah, it's about 25%. So, you know, and if you're really good at it, you bring the ratio that, that down much, much, much lower. And the game is to reduce the amount you spend on cooling and non compute. Um, uh, Facebook open source how they built that data center. So if you have a few hundred million dollars, 
Uh, you could build your own data center and follow that recipe. It may not be the best recipe, but it's nice to have a recipe for the common person to build a data center. So, if you, <laughs> so you know, uh, you'll, uh, you'll understand why I like recipes to build data centers in a little while. But you know, it's good to have sort of open, open information about how to build data centers. So I, I want to be very, very concrete about how to decide if you know if you're if to analyze big data, you have to sort of put it somewhere. So you have to put it on disk. You have to develop algorithms to analyze it. You have to have software to manage it. Uh, you have to uh, allow people to program it to sort of um, understand what the data looks like. And you, if you do that right, which most people don't, uh, <laughs> then uh, then you know as you get more data, you have to buy more computing equipment. You don't have to do other things. So um, if you if you go to cocktail parties and ask people what they do with big data, um, a lot of times what happens is they said, well, you know, uh, we we were running on one or two racks. And we got more data, so we added another couple racks. But you know, the database broke, the software stopped working, it just stopped working. And so, the, the way I like to think about this, you know, you could, in a container like that, sometimes called a modular data center, you could fit in, say, 20 <coughs> racks or something about that. So, if, if you add, if let's say you're doing a computation, you're trying to understand the gene genomic uh, variation associated with type 2 diabetes, and um, you're running at four racks. Um, but you get some more money from NIH, and now you can sequence another 500 genomes because what we're looking for is pretty rare, and we want the more genomes, the better. Um, you add four racks. If, when you add four racks, the, the analysis you're doing takes no more time, but you could do it over instead of one petabyte, two petabytes of data, instead of 500 or 600 uh, whole genomes, you could do it over 1,200 whole genomes. Then you build something that works. It's big, you know, I like to call it big data scale. Now, most computing infrastructure out there doesn't have that property. If you if you yeah. add more, if you if you get more data, things break. <laughs> um, and so this is sort of the beginning of, of the computer science and computer engineering of big data is to build um, the software and the and the and to manage the hardware and to design the algorithms and to do the analysis in such a way that um, when you have more data, you need more capital and you need more um, uh, you need more electricity, but you don't need more you don't need to redesign anything. So there. I want to talk a little bit about this transition from sort of the poster childs of big data science, which was for many years the LHC. And the way those projects were, and what my first big data project, or my second big, big data project, was a superconductor super collider. Um, does anyone remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, I, I like to think there was a spreadsheet mistake, and you know, they, they told people it's going to call the Bayon, but you know, there was, they had a spreadsheet problem, and it cost $10 billion, and um, they canceled the project. But I, I had a lot of fun learning about big data on that project, and you know those ideas still work. But you know those projects, like the uh, Large Hadron Collider and the uh, uh, LSSTs being built, have the following property. They, they, they take roughly a decade. There's one instrument. It costs roughly a billion dollars. They scatter the data to a couple a thousand scientists. Um, and, but at the beginning of the decade, Things looked very scary because you know you're spending a billion dollars and you're producing a lot of data. But but just by Moore's law, the natural progression of processors and the natural progression of storage, a decade later, it's not scary at all. So for example, the LHC, despite the fact that you know everyone thinks of as the poster child of big data, is only producing 15 petabytes of data a year. I mean, it's not something you could do at home on your laptop, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's sort of manageable by people who know how to work with data. Same thing for the LSST. And normally when I give a talk like this, I get attacked because you know a lot of people in science like to be known by the size of their data. And so I, <laughs> I, I've given the footnotes right here of what, how I can, what the, my justification is. They say it has to be bigger than that. It's not any bigger than that. It, that's all the size it is. Now, compare that to something like genomics. In genomics, the technology changes every two to three years. It costs roughly several hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars for uh, um, a sequencer. Uh, it produces, uh, uh, you know, every week you get data out, and there are literally thousands of them around. 
And you're not scattering data from one instrument, you're trying to understand the data from all the instruments. So that, that's, to me, the beginning of big data. It, 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 and so right now, we, we have a number of projects that produce a 1,000 genomes. Um, we are trying to do projects, if you're at, um, you know, NI, NIH now, in their, when they're looking out three or four years, they're thinking, can we do a million genomes? That that's sort of the scale that you need to understand things. A million genomes would be an would be a large uh, project. Um, that would be the uh, you'll see. But that's it's roughly um, a thousand a thousand petabytes or what they, uh, what's sometimes called a zettabyte. Uh, so I, I wonder. This is a uh, the you can see DNA sequencing is going to be commoditized. And I'm going to explain throughout this talk what the impact is. But in a few years, it's only going to cost $1,000. Now, that may sound like a lot of money, but if, you know, if you're sick and if we sequence your tumor and we know what treatment to do based on that sequence and different treatments cost on the order of $10,000, then that's money well spent. And um, over time, um, you, we're going to be sequencing absolutely everything. I think there, there, there are chairs around here. I just mentioned the thousand dollar genome, so it's a good time to come in. <laughs> it's going to be a hundred dollars by the time you find a chair. <laughs> okay, so this is I, you know, I, I never know in a group like this whether uh, how, how quantitative I'm going to be. I su I suspect fairly very quantitative. So this graph is pretty important. This graph right here, the blue line, is the scale at which uh, Moore's law and also what I call Johnson's Law, the speed at which, um, the, the, the rate at which processors, I'm sorry, which storage drives increase in capacity. So, you know, every 18 months and, uh, from processors, more or less, maybe every 12 to 15, maybe 15 months for, for storage, we, we basically double in speed of, of the storage. So, you know, if you do big data, there are, there are only two positions to be in. Um, you know, this yellow line is, until very recently, the rate at which sequencing data was growing. So sequencing data was growing, it was growing exponentially. Um, on the other hand, it was not growing as fast as the storage capacity of disks and the processing power of, of processors. So, you know, you, you, you know, if you did your job competently, you're okay. Around uh, 2003, 2004, new generations came in, and for some reason the marketing people in genomics were asleep. So they called this next generation sequencing, as in, I guess there was only gonna be one next generation and this is gonna be it. <laughs> so with next generation sequencing, which was generally new technology, the amount of data began to grow substantially faster than um, the uh, Moore's Law and uh, 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 Johnson's Law, et cetera. And so th there's a problem. And so I guess in science these days we don't have problems, we only have opportunities. So that, that was the opportunity that I sort of got interested in. Um, now, I'm not an, there's probably several people here who know a lot more about uh, prostate kind of cancer than I do. Um, I just want to point out something about all cancer genomes. Um, all cancer genomes, I shouldn't say all cancer genomes. The majority of cancer genomes seem to have the following two properties. The, the, if you sequence the, the, the tumor, um, the tumor's genomic composition changes over time. So it's, it's changing over time, it's reacting to the, to the chemotherapy, et cetera, and it's naturally evolving. Okay, that's not good. Um, number two, the tumor's genomic composition changes depending upon, uh, varies depending upon what you sequence within the tumor. So there are so-called clonal um, variations in there, and different parts of the tumor are from, grown from different cells that are all cancerous. So the complexity of cancer is not only is it multiple diseases, but a single tumor changes spatially and temporally. So in the past, when we spent $2.7 billion to sequence the first, and spent a decade to sequence the first human, um, the first human sequence and thought we were done, it, it's not so simple. 
that you know that was the germline, but the, the there's a lot of other things going on. But the thing to keep in mind is with ubiquitous sequencing, there's going to be a lot of data, and that data is going to impact what, what's beginning to be called precision treatment. How do you treat things based upon the tumor at a particular time? Um, how it is that? And so instead of you know 400 gigabytes of data. And, and, you know, there are ways to compress it and so on, but instead of 400 gigabytes of data for a given, for, for, for a human, for a species, you know, for a tumor at a particular time in a particular place, we have 400 gigabytes of data, and that data matters. And so far, you haven't even mentioned the epigenomes. Yeah, I haven't mentioned, and so I haven't mentioned epi, and I haven't mentioned the microbiome, all of which the stuff we're doing. And, yes. But that's why it's called. Oh, yeah. Presentation with the solution. Oh, with the solution. <laughs> so uh, the other thing is, I'm talking about big data, but in the same way, I, I'm simplifying by talking about genomic data. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about transcription and translation. I'm not going to talk about epigenomics. I'm not going to talk about the microbiome and other things. Uh, I, I, big is sort of a simple way to talk to 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 to, to, to structure the talk, but. Imaging data, there's a lot of next generation imaging devices. There's a lot of movies being produced at the cellular level of how cells change in real time. There's, uh, there's a lot of text. There's a, pa patients are, gonna, are, are soon going to be wearing sensors. So there's a very, very rich subset of data that's fundamentally important um, and it's going to impact biology, medicine, and healthcare. And just for simplicity, I'm going to simplify what I, uh, I'm going to restrict what I talk about. But this is a, it's a, we should really talk about big and complex data. But whenever you try to name an initiative or paper big and complex, it, it's a little harder to explain, but it's, we're, it's really big and complex. So, um, <laughs> there used to be the excuse that no one had data, so it really didn't matter whether you had new statistics. Well, now everyone has data, so there's no excuse if you don't know some statistics. You, you know, at least that's how I read that. So, science begins, uh, you know, uh, experimental science begins with instruments. So, if there's going to be a big data science, there has to be a big data instrument. So, I, I want you to think for a minute, what is the, what is the instrument for big data? I don't know. So, this is the instrument that produced astronomy. That's the instrument that produced microscopy. So, what's the instrument that's going to produce data science? So, uh, these are real pictures that I took from the internet. <laughs> and then I spent an afternoon and I did, I actually tried to compute this as best as I could, but if there are people who have extra time on their hands and want to give me the real numbers, I would appreciate it, so um, please contact me. So th this is in the 17th century when people built that initial telescope, more or less this seemed to give you a resolution of 30x over the human eye. The microscope seemed to have given you, as best as I can tell, over the human eye, 250x. Who recognizes that computer? Craig, Craig one. And it, again, this is my, my computation, which could be wrong, over standard <laughs> computers at that time was about 10 to 100x, around 1976. And that created, um, which I think one of the other talks was about, sim what we now call simulation science. So we speak of four paradigms these days, or re you know, uh, th how do we make discoveries in theory? How do we do it in experimental science? How do we do it through simulation? There, there are a couple of chairs. You, could, you want a chair? How do we do it through simulation? And we're trying to understand if we can create the foundations of how you make discoveries. You know, we've always had data, but is there a science of data? What do you mean by 10x or 100x in conjunction with simulation? Can you give us an example? Yeah, so if it took um, uh, um, a month, if it took um, um, let me make it easy. Uh, if it took 10 months to run a, a, a simulation, a molecular simulation on a, a large computer in 1976, it took 10 months to run that simulation because of the, of the fine time steps about it. That simulation could be run roughly in one month on a frame one. 
So th that's all it needs. So in, if we do diagnoses, we could ask the same question. So you could think of the microscope, not as a, it's creating a science, but making ability to make diagnoses, same thing with an x-ray and a CT scan. Okay, so what I'm gonna sort of argue here, and before I do that, let me give the traditional view. So the way we are more or less doing informatics, so informatics is computer science applied to you know, basically, uh, uh, applied computer science to understand disciplinary science. Uh, if you think of informatics supporting research um, in the biological sciences, that's bio, bi um, bioinformatics. If you think of informatics supporting clinical, improving clinical care, so clinical care is improved, that's clinical informatics. There's been a push um, uh, for the last five years, eight years, to try to take things in that we get on the, in the laboratory about drugs, about uh, cancer processes, and um, impact clinical care. That's called translational informatics. It's more or less done at the scale of a, of a rack of computers. So, I, so my proposal is the instrument is the data center. And you know, in science, we have to think about a, a, a sort of a simple way to build a data center. So the data center you know, can be built from these, contain these modular data centers that cost three to eight million dollars. If you put, you know, you could put a hundred of them, uh, you could put, you know, 50, uh, uh, 55 million dollar containers together and get a 250 million dollar data center. But the, the, if I, I sort of, the, the thought process I'm thinking about is if I do, if my instrument is a modular data center, then how does, how does, how, what can I do with that instrument that I couldn't do before? So if more or less, even in 2004, if you looked at the early Google data centers, it was 10 to 100, maybe even uh, much higher than 100, uh, more data that was then being managed by other processes. So we have a, so this is the thought question I want you to think about. There, there, there are three possibilities. We have a new instrument. We have at least two orders of magnitude better resolution to look at data. There are three possibilities. Possibility number one, the people today because they're doing, you know, they're they're using social media. They're, there's a lot more things they could do. They're just not as smart as they were in the 17th and 18th century. <laughs> and we're not going to create a new science because we just don't have the ability to create a new science because you know we're just not like that anymore. So that's possibility number one. You know, we got a new instrument, but if so what? No, possibility number two is we're going to create a new science because we got a new instrument that's 100 times bigger, maybe, maybe substantially bigger than that, than our last instrument. We just have to sort of create the foundations of the subject, uh, uh, and, you know, engineer it, and you know, uh, create an intellectual discipline around it. And you know, my, my bet, and this is, this is you know, the second part of possibility number two, is that we can do it at the University of Chicago. So that, that's what I'm excited about. Um, here's another thought experiment. Um, the amount of data in a data center is hundreds of petabytes. I'm sorry. The, the amount of data at NCB, so if you do research that's supported by NIH, you have to put the data in NC, NCBI. It's a condition of, of, of doing research. The, in 2010, it's about, it's a bigger than that now, I'll tell you in a minute. In 2010, I measured it, there was about two petabytes of data available. It was available for download. No one had ever computed over that because they had never had a structure in which you can compute over two petabytes of data. So in, in other areas that are fundamentally important to society, like online advertising, you compute <laughs> over the data every night to make the world a better place. <laughs> Same thing in a lot of other disciplines. So if we could do this in, in, you know, in important disciplines like online advertising, you can ask the question, shouldn't we be doing this in, in, you know, in sort of important disciplines like biology, medicine, and healthcare? Online advertising is a very important discipline. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Um, it's, it's a little bigger than that. I think it's about four to five petabytes, but we still haven't computed over it. So that, that's another thing we like to do. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the origins of this because um, it's really important if we're going to understand how to do big data science. You have to, well, it helps to understand a little bit of the history. So what was it? Origins of high performance computing? I'm not a historian, so I did a little research for this talk. Institute of Computer Research, U of C. 
<laughs> so what's the origin of supercomputing? So um, I, you know, there's this report from, I, 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 I spent a day doing research. This seems to be one of the main origins if you look at it. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, we, there are a lot of smart people, a lot of technology development in the, in the sort of the period 1940 <coughs> to 1950, and um, they developed, they needed computers because if you had computers, you could um, uh, read traffic from devices like this. This is, this is just um, what Kenneth Flam says in the book, Creating the Computer, Government, Industry, and High Technology from the Brookings Institute. So this is not my opinion, this is, this is uh, Kenneth Flam. Um, so the, the initial computers out there, this is one, what considered one of the first supercomputers, um, the CDC 6600, um, you know, the origins were um, trying to, um, were, were from the operas of World War II in the areas of cryptanalysis and, weapon, and nuclear weapons design. So they, you'll see why this is important, because this led to our interest in high-performance computing for simulation, so it led to a culture in which when we did high-performance computing, we built computers like the Cray, we built computers like the Blue Gene, we programmed them in a certain way, and they were designed to do very, very, very fast simulation, but they were not designed to work with big data. So in, in science, by and large, we never had the opportunity to work with the big data because that's not what was driving things. So what's the origins of big data? So who, who you know, many of you were, it sounds like a couple of you were involved in the origins of big data. So why do I know about the origins of big data? I, I, you know, this is being recorded, so I'll tell a, an abbreviated version of this story. Um, I know the, about the origins of big data because I went to an event primarily to, because there was, it was a nice vacation and I could sort of give a talk, it was in 2006, <laughs> and I, I gave this talk, but I felt since, I, since it was a beautiful area that I should go to some of the other talks. And so um, I went to these other talks even though I wasn't really interested in this. <laughs> and the, the talks were about um, managing big data with file systems. I was working in another area of research then. And so uh, all the people who had big file systems got up and talked. So the big file systems at that point were really owned by DOD and uh, the Department of, uh, Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. And you know they ran these big simulations and they needed big file systems. And so they got up, and you know, it wasn't my area, so I thought I was just listening um, to be polite. And you know, they got up for a day and a half, and you know, charitably speaking, you sort of didn't believe that any of these things worked. <laughs> and, you know, they were doing the best they can, but you know, they really weren't going to scale, and you know, you know, you had to do something. And then this guy got up, um, <clears throat> um, named um, Sean Quinlan. And does anyone know Sean Quinlan? No, so anyway, he got up, um, and he wasn't even supposed to be there because he was from, uh, from a company. And he described this, this, this file system that they, he had built with about 10 of his friends. And, you know, after that talk, I sort of believed that would scale. It would scale to a whole building. And so, um, and so why would he build this file system? And I knew his dad, so I went up there afterwards, and I said, you know, his dad was a famous machine learning person named Ross Quinlan. Who, built, who, who, who sort of did a lot of work in early uh, tree-based classifiers. Oops. Okay, so this is why. So it, it turns out that you know, um, if you can manage if you can manage hundreds of petabytes of data, and if you can build statistical models over it, you could. I typed big data into a search engine, and it gave me information about big data. But it also, and I didn't even ask it, it just liked me and did it anyway. It, it gave me some online ads. And it turns out that that online ads generate billions of dollars. And um, if you generate enough billions of dollars, then small improvements in the big data infrastructure generates more billions of dollars. So unlike in science, and unlike where we don't have this sort of very simple way, if we get slightly better at something, we get a few more billions of dollars. They have this. <laughs> they have this in online advertising, and so in the period from about 2000 to about 2010, you know, they were not telling people very much about what was going on, but doing big data. And then, you know, for reasons that I really don't know, um, Sean Quinlan and others um, in three teams sort of wrote three pretty important papers about how Google did a file system that scaled to a data center. 
um, did a parallel programming framework over that called MapReduce that was not done the way that the uh, Department of Energy and the Department of Defense were doing their parallel programming frameworks with MPI and other things, and then designed a sort of a simple data, a simple database-like structure over that called Bigtable. And this sort of was the beginning. It took, you know, and, and the, you know, the people at NSF and the other agencies caught this up within five years or six years. They really were on top of this. Um, but, uh, <laughs> This, uh, this, I think, it was a really interesting turning point. So, you know, there's actually a debt we know, but I'm going to tell you a little about this because if you're going to do big data science, you need to know about big data co computational advertising. So, um, there is a, an emerging field called computational advertising. I'm borrowing the definition of Andre Broder. It's, it's really about the best match between, you know, something, say, in a search or other context uh, with, um, a user in a context and a suitable advertisement. So why, why, why are people doing this? Well, they're doing this because it's a $70 billion industry. And in a $70 billion industry, there's a lot of talent attracted. And they're getting very good at this. And if you get much better at it, you get an extra billion dollars. And that money adds up to real money after a while. And you get better interest. <laughs> so um, if anyone hasn't seen this, this is one of several charts that shows this nice point world, $70 billion world of computational advertising. So, you know, the, the, the starting place, I, 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 my, my starting point a few years ago was, well, if they could do this for these, these very important areas like computational advertising, why shouldn't we use the same infrastructure techniques and algorithms and see what we could do about biology, medicine, and healthcare? So I've been sort of trying to reverse engineer this and apply it to these other, these other areas. So this is um, my picture of, um, you know, this is what high performance computing at a very, very high level. Of, do we have any computer architects in the room? Okay, okay, well, forgive me. Um, you know, more or less, a high performance computer consists these days of a lot of chips with a very expensive fabric that connects them. That is, these things have to be very close together because you care, you know, about the latency, how many, um, nanoseconds and milliseconds it takes things to get. And then, you know, because they realize you can't completely ignore this far away in terms of this latency or disk. And that that doesn't allow you to, this if you want to compute over all the data, that obviously doesn't work because there's bottleneck, the disk is too far away. So in sort of this other scale, when you have a data center, what you do is above each spindle, you put a processor and, you know, so you can compute over the entire data center with one operation. So if I have a function, you know, I, we, we, we did a project, I think, what you, there's a, sir, there, there's some chairs over here. Where? Oh, over here. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you have a data center, you want to apply a function over the whole data center, the right-hand architecture works, but the left-hand doesn't. The right-hand architecture was developed by Google and Facebook and others. The left-hand architecture was designed by scientists working in areas of simulation and other areas. And they're both equally important. Not, not One is not better than the other, but the world is richer having both of them. Um, so I, I, this is the end of my um, sort of survey. But what I just described is what I like to call act one of analytics. I described the Google Yahoo infrastructure. I did not design, you know, how you might do large scale graphs and what the analytics look like that. That's relevant for biology, medicine, and healthcare. I did not describe uh, this other very important computational problem. Um, this is so if, you know, very soon now and even more later, you could use this device and buy things. When you do this advice and buy things, what people in computational advertising do to make your life easier is they geolocate you, they uh, look at all your past purchases, they try to figure out what you're interested in, they look at their neighbor, they look at where you are and all the merchants in that area, um, they look at the inventory for all the merchants in that area and what they're interested in pushing, and then they send you a coupon to make your life better. <laughs> and, they, and they do that in less than a second. 
And so, you know, they do that for billions of, they're gonna, we're gonna do this for billions of devices in less than a second with all available information, and that's what I call Act 3. So, you know, we have, and this is gonna be important in healthcare, I'm gonna come back to that, so keep Act 3 in mind. Act 2 is about graphs, well we have graphs in medicine, and uh, in healthcare we have networks, uh, we have all sorts of networks, and understanding those networks is important because a lot of cancer impacts um, uh, it impacts uh, uh, networks. All right, let me put my phone back. It'll come back. It'll come up. Um, this is this is sort of a you know I I, I I I painted this a little more starkly than I should have just just to keep you awake because it's after lunch. Um, but it's really been from another viewpoint, it's been a, a somewhat gradual evolution. Um, the name changes about once a decade, but what we and the scale changes about once a decade, and sort of the algorithm of choice changes about once a decade. But you know, we did uh, computationally intensive statistics over PCs in 1984. Uh, I put this here because that that's the kind of tree that uh, uh, Ross Quinlan did that his son later did GFS. Um, we did, these are what we'll called Baywolf clusters. We did Baywolf clusters around 1993. We got a new algorithm called support vector machines and we got tired of using the term computationally intensive statistics. We called it data mining and knowledge discovery databases. Um, 2004, about a decade later, that's when the uh, uh, anatomy of a large scale hypertext web search engine, not a good name, but it was written by Grin and Page, and turned out to be a pretty important paper, um, <laughs> describing how to do graphs um, formed by the internet, did basically how to do eigenvalue analysis of graphs, they didn't phrase it this way, of the internet over a large scale um, computational infrastructure. And then data mining was, was you know, associated with you know, socially unpopular things, so they changed the word to predictive modeling. But <laughs> You know, this is just progress is slow, and we're, it's you, it's probably good to think of this in an evolutionary context. <laughs> okay, I want to um, let's see. I started at one thirty. I end at two fifteen. Two forty five. But we want lots of yeah. I got so this is. Um, I want to talk a little about medicine and healthcare, and then we'll come back to some challenges. So. We just put the th we 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 build a computational infrastructure to do big data biology, medicine, healthcare, and we put the thousand genomes data sets in one of the largest data sets. So, I, um, turns out once we struggled to put it in there, it wasn't that useful. But <laughs> we have bragging rights. Um, the uh, I was at a meeting uh, where the head of NIH got up and um, said, you know, they had. Um, you know, struggled and they had put to make the, uh, more available to, to scientists the thousand genomes data set into Amazon. And I'm thinking, well, he just did this in a press conference. We had it for six months. I never thought that we should, we had it actually for a month. I never thought to do a press conference, but anyway. The, the thousand genomes is on the Chicago campus and in Amazon. And in, in a way you can compute over it, and in NCBI in a way you can't compute over it. So, uh, this is, this is a somewhat complicated chart, but let me walk you through it. Um, if, if you take the genome, and again, I should talk about all the other things, but I'm trying to keep this accessible to everyone. If you have a single um, change, a single poly, change or polymorphism in the genome at one place, um, in, we used to think that, that would, you know, that's a mutation say, and we used to think that that, you know, that single gene mutations can cause some diseases. Those are sometimes called Mendeley, those, and the two different types, the, 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 the first one before the change and the second one are called two different alleles. Um, so some alleles can call, um, can cause disease like that, and those are called Mendelian because they're just from one gene. Um, so most things aren't like that. So that didn't work. So then we, then, we tr then we thought, well, it might not be just one, it's clearly not one gene, it could be several genes. So w we did for about a decade what were called genome-wide association studies. We looked at phenotypes of disease and we looked statistically at 
at all the genes that conceivably could impact that. Now there's all sorts of signaling and non and non gene like things that we now know are very important, but at least we should be able to pick out, you know, if there um, multiple genes impacted a particular disease, you know, caused a particular disease. That was called genome wide association studies. Um, that didn't work. Now, why didn't that work? That didn't work because the way this was done, this was looking what were called common variants. So these are these are common types of variants that say occur at five percent or more in the population. And there was sort of sometimes people use the word dark matter. They're, they're just all this genomic variation that didn't explain didn't seem to be explained either by the uh, Mendelian side or this complex these common disease side. And so the the, the view these days. And this is why big data is important, is it's that a lot of diseases and a lot of phenotypes are uh, uh, expressed as uh, rare combinations, I'm sorry, combinations of relatively rare alleles or, or changes. And so that's, that's in here. And the, uh, the other axis is if you do have an allele, is it expressed in a phenotype? Just because you have an allele may be silent, it may not be expressed. And the more likely it is to be expressed is called the penetrance. And so the reason we're interested in, in, the reason big data is absolutely critical is this failed, this is common, this would, the data wouldn't have been this big, and that failed. And so we're trying to understand relatively rare combinations of, um, of alleles to explain the variation we see. And then this doesn't even begin to ex ex touch tumors that I already talked about. So this is the error of big data. And let me, uh, we, we're working on this type, we're supporting Nancy Cox and other investigators here in this type 2 diabetes project. This is the same graph, um, same axes, but these are the genes that are probably related, that, that are known to be related to type 2, that, to impact type 2 diabetes. And there's this whole space in the middle that we're trying to fill in with these six, by having 600 genomes, the entire genome sequence, to look for, and, and again, if you think about it, 600 is not really enough. You need a thousands, and we don't have them. So this is the beginning of, of, of looking for these things. So this is a slide um, from Barbara Wall. There's a NIA, the National Cancer Institute just set up something called the Center for Cancer Genomics, or CCG. This is their roadmap. Um, this is, the, you know, this is sort of uh, one of the ways that uh, CCG is thinking of the roadmap for the next few years. The idea is to get precision treatment that's informed by the particular, the, the genomics of the particular individual, the genomics of the particular tumor, and that, that would inform, that would be for both drug development, pathway function is the particular uh, uh, mutation impacting a particular pathway that we could target with a particular drug, and also for better di uh, diagnoses. And a lot of this is to get enough data, and I'm going to go to another theme. Uh, the, a the, I think there's going to be a transition in how we collect data. This is related to a discussion. Um, we, we, there, a couple of us were talking about privacy, and if you think about this, you know, um, there's some pretty uh, serious discussions you, as you do big data you have to have about privacy and um, it would really you know one of the things that people are trying to do is build infrastructure to give people more control over their data but make it easier for them to put it into large data sets such as you know thousand million genome data sets so that you could actually um, um, facilitate discoveries okay does anyone these maps are pretty famous has anyone raise your hand if you've seen these maps yeah, these are pretty scary maps. Um, let me just take some more. So um, these are on CDC. You can go there. Um, I, you, you get them for every year. Um, uh, red is um, bio, you know, is states in which there's a certain uh, critical percentage. Uh, these are the uh, percentage. Uh, the, I'm sorry. The, it's a heat map of how many people are obese, BMI over 30. It's a heat map. So in a decade, um, there's been an absolutely fundamental shift. So, you know, um, 
this is sort of the way a lot of people think of how we analyze data. It's an interesting map. It clearly shows something's going on. You could begin to do it. Um, I want to talk about sort of how we can think of this from a big data perspective. So um, does anyone have one of these? Not the top two, the bottom two. <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk about this. This is um, uh, <coughs> there's a project that we're doing here called um, Social Determinants of Health. Um, this is a way to collect data that's complete. Well, it's a way to collect data in which you don't have to tell your age, you don't have to tell what diseases you have, you don't have to say anything about you. But the, the, um, he, here's the game. Um, a number of people have put apps on their phone and every four to ten seconds that app will say where you are. It won't say anything else about you, but it will say where you are. Okay? Now, so here's a thought experiment. Let's say that a few thousand people did that and we knew where they were. Say 10,000 people did that. And we, know, and we know where they were. We know nothing else about them. But for you know, but for one out of a thousand of those people, I have I, I, I ask them to give me a little bit of their um, medical information. So one out of a thousand people give me their medical information, but um, ten times that many um, give me their location. So, so the, here's the thought experiment: Could we? Is there enough information there to radically improve healthcare? Now. Why, why, why is this not absurd? Well, it's not absurd because in one second, I can build algorithms that will pull everyone's information about all the purchases they've made, uh, geo take their current geolocation, see what's around them, and build a full statistical model and send out an ad. So, you know, yeah. What about uh, people who are likely to give you information are they... Well, that's a whole other question. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. So let's look at some examples of this. So did, who, anyone recognize this guy? He used to live in Illinois. We, do we know who he is? What? This is, this is, he's not a shy man. I, I'm on a couple of committees with him, um, and I asked about this picture. At, at the, I made the mistake of asking him about this picture at the beginning of dinner. And he, and I learned a lot about this. Um, so this is this is a very famous person. Uh, this is uh, Larry Smarr. Uh, he used to run run the supercomputer center at Ur Urbana. Um, he's part of the um, mo movement called self tracking. So what he does is a couple times, uh, of several times a year. He gets physiological tests like that, but every day he wears devices that say you measure his activity, his heart rate, his sleep. He sends off stools and um, and spit and other things for microbiome analysis. He gets his sequencing done regularly. He's 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 tr he seems to be the current winner of the person who's generated the most information about himself <laughs> that he's willing to make available to the community. So there's a whole community out there that's making data available. And it, it's a very interesting story. Um, um, this, was, this is a picture from the tech, MIT Tech Review. It describes a little bit of, Larry's a great guy, you know, um, and, and his story is very interesting, but he's, he's part of what's called self-tracking. Is it Gina Benzica? Yes. And so there's also a, a number of people have decided to make their genome, not to sequence their genome, but to make it publicly available, and Larry's one of them. And so, you know, there's this whole other side of things um, that people are beginning to make their data available, um, uh, inform people for research. And so he, he, he and a number of other people are giving very, very rich things. You know? This sounds like a very advanced one with the Framingham study and all that. Yeah, I but mean, super it is. But look at this. Anyone recognize that? This is Aaron Parecki, a young guy. And what he did, this is 
two, three and a half years, every three seconds, every three to six seconds, except when he was somewhere for a long period of time, he took a nap, plus a lot of batteries, because this is, right now, it requires a lot of batteries, and he exposed his tracks. This is his tracks for about two to three years. So, and we, if we know nothing else, I claim if we had 10,000 tracks like this, you know, we would know, we know what kind of food you eat. We know, we know what kind of activity you do. We know a lot of the social determinism of health. We, we know all sorts of things. And, you know, it just changes the way. So I just want you to think about this kind of stuff, which is hard to action, versus this level of granularity, especially as we try to do social determinants of health. It's, and marry that to sort of data that comes from this level of genomics and you know all the um, current ways we th think of having the genomics. So there's some, um, some steps in this direction. I mean, this is about data. So there's some steps in that data. Patients like me, it's very interesting. These are patients who share information. Um, the Army of Women is another one of these about breast cancer. So again, this is just, so, you know, I spent a number of years taking complex problems and trying to squeeze an extra 3% of all of them just by looking at data. So most of you know, everyone knows these figures better than I do, but in 2011, we spent $2.7 trillion in the U.S. on healthcare, you know, $8,600 per person, 17.7% of the GDP. And we, from the viewpoint of this talk, we have essentially no data about this. So the question is, could we, it would more data shave 5% off of that? You know, that seems like a realistic goal. But the data collection would cost 5%. No, net, 5% net. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then how would the pharmaceutical companies and hospitals and doctors feel about this? Feel about that? That your program, like, how would the people that benefit from that $2.7 trillion. Oh, you mean the economics of that? We'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, because I'm now going to dive into what we're doing here. Yeah. One of the other things is that the majority of the research is funded by the drug companies, and they don't. It's a shame. If you take almost any other industry with that degree of money, you would have a certain percentage that's automatically into r and You know, everyone else has tried this. I think we should let the big data people have a swap. I mean, everyone else has failed. I mean, even if we fail, it can't be that bad. <laughs> I think it should be publicly funded. All right, what are we doing here? So um, I'm going to tell you uh, the, group I, the research group I, I, I'm working with. Uh, the Center for Research Informatics, um, um, and one of these, is, uh, one, a couple of these are joint with the Institute for Genomics and System Biology. We're trying to do big data biology, medicine, and healthcare. So what are we doing? Uh, we have three initiatives. We have a, we just finished a phase one of a clinical research data warehouse. This allows us to get phenotype data from patients um, in a consented way. Uh, we're just we 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 spent a couple years building a genome cloud. We're going to try to scale this up significantly next year. We're sort of actively sort of raising funds to do this. That, uh, the prototype is how we manage a little bit of the type 2 diabetes data, the, uh, a project called the 1000 uh, Cancer Genome Project out of IGSB. And we're uh, trying to start something real time clinical for uh, in real time clinical alerts, I'll tell you about. And more, you know, th I think that the main thing we're doing is trying to encourage our researchers to try to work out the discipline of big data science. So, um, a lot of um, hospitals have had these for a while, but we just put ours in place. Uh, we have electronic medical works from Epic, um, building data from Centricity, lab reports from uh, uh, SunQuest. So we have a, um, a clinical research data warehouse that we have um, uh, that we can do research um, both through, uh, of a variety of types that gives us the phenotype data so we can begin for, uh, these are roughly half a million patients who've been to our hospital over the last six years. 
Uh, there's a, 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 a genome cloud. I haven't talked a lot about clouds, but th this is sort of a, a, a mini, mini data center scale thing that should scale to larger data centers to um, help us take large amounts of gen gen genomics data to manage, analyze, and share it. Um, we have this view where we put the thousand genomes data in, a, in, 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 this is all an infrastructure, this is the clinical research data warehouse, this is, the, the cl this is sort of a, a controlled cloud with human genome data in it um, that has a PHI attached to it. Up there is data that's controlled um, like Framington study data and publicly data, publicly available data like the thousand genomes, and we're trying to think of this as one data center scale facility to analyze it. Right now we're at the level, I would say, you in terms of megawatts, we're about, a, uh, about three quarters of a megawatt, and we want to get to uh, two megawatts over the next couple of years. So about half to three quarters of a megawatt. So we're, re we're really not a player, but we're trying to be. Um, on the other hand, no one else is trying to be, so I think that gives us a leadership. <laughs> um, let me, this is something out of the White Lab, uh, out of IGSB. Um, this is taking genomes from two types of, uh, taking just, uh, there were um, uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancers uh, 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 and triple negative breast cancers, and at this point, it's not clear what the genomic basis of those two types of breast cancers are. So um, this is from whole genome data. Um, this is from uh, the White Lab. Um, and what this shows is that you, at least if you look at this whole genome data, that there seems to be a genomic basis. These are combinations of relatively rare alleles, but it allows you to separate triple negative breast cancer, which does not respond to standard treatments from estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which does. So you could sequence the tumor and make a precision treatment decision. And that's an example of why, if, if something's not going to respond, why treat it? But um, at this point, we don't sequence tumors to make those decisions. Uh, this is something with Dr. Dana Edelstein um, from the hospital. Um, we, this is the idea is you take the clinical research data warehouse, and you can build a predictive model over this. The predictive model that she's built, um, collaborating with some people from the Center for Research Informatics, is to predict what's called an in-house cardiac event. An in in-house cardiac, and we're trying to predict this one hour ahead of time. So um, from that prediction, you know, there'll be a score produced, and based on that score, so this can run over patients um, uh, who, who, who have sensors on them. If there's low risk, um, you won't do anything. If there's medium risk, you'll um, inform an, uh, an intern. If there's a, a high score, uh, you'll automatically trigger a rapid response team. And, um, you know, these, so the idea, you know, in the same way that um, people wear different types of sensors, in, in a few years, sensors will be more ubiquitous, we'll have more data, and we really don't have, you know, in, in a advertising, we'll make a prediction, what ad will you click on? In medicine, we tend not to do that based on real-time data, what will happen to you over the next, you know, are you likely to get an infection? Are you likely to have an in-house cardiac event? And so this is the kinds of things we're trying to do. I want to end just with some quick challenges. These are things that, the kinds of questions we're using to think about how we do research, then we'll have um, time for some questions. Um, we don't know how to program these things, so um, we're trying to figure out how to program these things. Um, there's this whole methodology where we spent 30 years building very complex models over small amounts of data, but you really want to do simple models over large amounts of data at scale, and that's a whole different way of looking at the world. We're trying to understand that. Um, Shannon created a whole foundations when no one expected it for information and communication theory, it'd be wonderful to have a Shannon-like foundation for big data science. Um, we, we, if you think about from a strategic viewpoint, say just for cor corporations, um, you know, we, CFOs came there because finance had a strategic importance. IT, because IT has a critical importance. Right now, we don't think of data as having a strategic importance, but data probably has as much strategic importance as IT and uh, finance. And so we're trying to think of what is the strategic importance of, of data and how does that impact, you know, not traditional data, but big data. 
So we're at a transition point. It's beginning to change how we do biology, medicine, and healthcare. Um, this is what we're trying to do. This is a schematic of a standard 15 megawatt commercial data center. It's designed for lots of small internet scale, uh, um, uh, internet scale compute. Um, and we're trying to figure out what would a science data center look like and how would we build that. So we need a name for that, so we're calling that the Burnham Data Center Initiative. <laughs> <laughs> okay.